Okay. Looks good. Uh, Thanks, Allison, and uh, thanks everyone for, for logging in for this um, or sticking around. Uh, yeah, what the, what the goal really is for, for my presentation is to kind of just provide some, some broad framing um, and, and context for at least where some of the thinking is around ways in which we might still be able to maintain some of the functions, if not even um, the ash species that are such a common part of both our riparian forest, but more importantly, um, across the broader region. And so given I'm summarizing kind of current thinking there are a lot of co-authors on this talk because really what, what I am is just the mouthpiece for a lot of other folks ideas around um, what's the current state of our knowledge in terms of um, you know, ways to protect individual ash trees as well as um, kind of maintain those critical functions that ash plays in our forest and then this will hopefully set up both Alaire and, and Joanne's talks to kind of drill into the landscape uh, a little more closely as to what different organizations are doing in response to this. So in terms of uh, thinking about emerald ash borer and, and, and kind of the, the watersheds that we're, we're dealing with with this group, um, you know, normally, you know, in Vermont, we kind of want to be first, you know, whether it's maple syrup production or American East basketball standings or, or for best, you know, New England IPA. But in the context of, of emerald ash borer, you know, we're actually a bit lucky to be towards the back of the pack, um, really the Northeast. Um, if we look at emerald ash borer and the protections through 2016 on the left, um, obviously, much of that was in the, in the Midwest, and it really wasn't until um, kind of 2018 when it, when it hit Vermont, where people really started thinking, well, what do I do about my ash, which is kind of interesting is the psychology of that. But nevertheless, um, you know, we, we've had a long time to, to learn from other places. And what it also means is that um, ash mortality so far in our landscape is not as pronounced or widespread as in other areas. And so there's still opportunities both to think through you know, are there ways to actually keep mature ash on our landscape? You know, options that really aren't being held in parts of Michigan where, where ash has been killed um, for, for over two decades now by emerald ash borer. And so what we do know from, from looking elsewhere is that emerald ash borer can have pretty pronounced and quite negative impacts um, on the landscape, um, you know, up to 99% mortality, if not 100, depending on, on where we're looking and, and just thinking about riparian forests. This is the Root River in Wisconsin. And that entire riparian corridor, you can see, you know, all the ash are being killed throughout that corridor. And so, you know, kind of the impacts on the function of that riparian forest and other values. At the same time, you know, there's been a lot of work going, going into, you know, ways to combat this, um, both at the individual tree and even now at the stand and landscape scale. And so um, are there some opportunities as we're looking at our riparian forest here in the Northeast where green ash either has naturally been a major component um, as well as black ash to a lesser extent, or where a lot of reforestation efforts, ironically, have used those species um, to, to restore riparian forests. Are there ways for us to think through, you know, um, can we actually preserve some of those individuals um, or at least preserve some of the functions that um, they've served over time? So when we talk about protecting individual trees, um, really, and Joanne will certainly touch on this a bit, you know, the historic focus, and there's been a lot of work on even here in, in Burlington, you know, can we treat individual street trees and, and maintain those as healthy individuals despite um, the pressures that emerald ash borer might have on the landscape. And so the, the, the map on the right is from the city of Somerville in, in Massachusetts, you know, kind of giving a sense for just the amount of trees that are being treated um, you know, across that landscape, you know, over 782 trees, um, which is pretty feasible when you're, when you're thinking about kind of you know, walking down sidewalks and into parks and being able to monitor individual trees and also leverage um, the budgets that a municipality might have for those types of things. But a lot of the thinking now that's been coming about is are there actually situations or, or ways that we might be able to do some of these things in forested settings, you know, in, in Vermont and in other parts of the, the watersheds we're, we're dealing with, um, including in riparian forests. And, kind of, and, and, and so why would we do that? Like, why would we even consider doing something that historically has just been thought about in, in more of a uh, urban context, but also, you know, what, what might be some of the kind of the ways in my, what, which we might approach this. And so I'll kind of start with the, the why and then get into the, the what we know in terms of the how. So in terms of the why, you know, from my perspective, when we're talking about ash and many other threatened species, um, a key thing we need to ground ourselves in are what, what are the cultural impacts of the loss of the species? And in the case of black ash in particular, um, for a region, certainly um, the ancestral lands that my office sits on, Wab Wabanaki people, um, the Haudenosaunee, others that kind of intersect with the watersheds we work in, um, black ash is central both to the creation story of the Abenaki people as well as importantly throughout the range of black ash is, is a critical um, cultural life way in, in terms of baskets and snowshoes and other materials. And so one reason why we might be thinking about preserving the species is, is importantly trying to preserve those cultural values both in the form of living individuals still on the landscape as well as preserving those materials like ash splints that are so important 
um, to these lifeways. A lot of the discussion though, certainly when we're talking about riparian forests and, and, and other ecosystems is what are the functions that species like green ash or black ash or white ash um, you know, present to an ecosystem and how might those functions be impacted or lost if we lose the species? And, and so functionally, certainly one of the things we wanna preserve in the context of our riparian ash are the functions that it serves with you know, water filtration, you know, flood attenuation, um, kind of stabilizing soils, but also even functions um, that, it, that it, it serves in terms of the litter quality. And so both green, black and white ash have extremely high quality litter. So some of the work that we've done has, has looked at tadpole productivity, um, caddis fly productivity when reared with um, different litter quality and ash you know, always comes out as the top litter um, kind of food source for those species. And so thinking through, you know, can we maintain some of those functions um, in these areas, um, even, even while it's threatened by this novel threat. And then finally, um, a lot of the discussion also gets into, can we just preserve um, some genetic resource in the landscape? Um, so other individuals that we can protect or, or identify for protection that might give us opportunities in the future um, for possibly kind of reintroducing the species in, in areas once it's, it's wiped out on largely from its range. So I'm gonna get into um, just kind of broad approaches to preservation. Um, and then again, I know, I know Alara and Joanne are gonna talk more about specific kind of work happening um, in the region as it relates to ash. But a lot of times when I talk about ash and, and maintaining options in the landscape, it's, it's more in this context. So here on the left, um, in the uplands where we have white ash as a, as, a, as a component of our Northern hardwood forest. And so many of the discussions we have in those contexts are, can you, you know, if you're gonna harvest ash, um, you know, which is obviously more commonly occurring in uplands than in riparian areas, um, can you do that in ways that actually retain future options for ash on those sites? And so certainly a key civil cultural consideration. But in the context of, of riparian systems, you know, and when we think about a threatened species, oftentimes um, the reaction is well, we need to get rid of it. You know, we don't want those hazard trees to be out there or we want to kind of at least minimize that risk. And one of the key kind of first decisions that I think we, we all need to be making around emerald ash borer and the threat it poses is that we should be leaving some trees behind to actually face that threat. Um, and, and the reason for that is that there's a lot of evidence um, that there are lingering ash, um, basically um, in areas where there's been, you know, widespread EAB presence and mortality, that there still are, are many ash that have survived in those areas. And so um, if you cut those trees down, um, you know, really are not giving them the chance to linger. And so finding ways to do that. And if you look at the three ash species we have in the Northeast, um, unfortunately, black ash really has not shown much for, for natural resistance. White ash, again, uh, not as helpful for riparian areas, but there has been some work that's shown pretty high levels of resistance in white ash, depending on the, the, the vigor of the, the stand and, and the trees. And green ash falls a little bit behind, um, you know, sometimes three to 5% of the green ash in some of these high infestation areas are surviving. But if you look at the map in the center, this is from some work that actually was um, quite opportunistic. Um, there was a, a provenance uh, study at Penn State where basically um, they were growing um, you know, different green ash uh, provenances. So green ash um, being grown from different seed sources um, and it was actually infested by emerald ash borer. And so they were able to look at kind of differential mortality depending on um, where that seed came from. So there are certainly seed sources like from Indiana and Illinois that had really high, you know, kind of low, low levels of, of mortality um, where other, other seed sources where there was really high levels of mortality and, and, and the seed sources that came from um, within the Champlain Basin actually were kind of intermediate. And so suggesting that you know, there might actually be some inherent um, in genetic resistance within our populations that are worth looking at. And so if you're gonna leave trees behind, you know, kind of bigger trees certainly better because not only is a, a large living ash great, but a, a large dead ash is great ecologically. Um, but also um, looking for female trees and, and trees that have unhealthy crowns as kind of key, key characteristics. What's happened in other parts of the range of ash, particularly in riparian forests, there's, there's been a tremendous push for diversifying ash dominated riparian areas um, in the Lake States region. Um, so much so that there's now NRCS cost share assistance for diversifying ash stands um, in Michigan, as well as now in Wisconsin. And a big emphasis has been, can we go into these riparian zones like we're looking at here, that do have this heavy ash component and either underplant or, or kind of opportunistically plant in gaps. Um, other species that are clearly non-ash um, EAB host species, but that functionally um, certainly can, can grow in those, those scenarios. And so species like sycamore, um, you know, silver maple, uh, swamp white oak, you're seeing a picture of a swamp white oak on the right that is now um, 10 years old, um, growing in, a, in an ash wetland, that have at least given some options for at least creating potential resilience um, to that loss. And from this work, you know, as you all know, you know, larger stock has certainly been, been ideal, uh, but of course, just 
you know, we often don't have a choice because stock is so limited in general I mean, our planting applications, but if you can get larger stock um, as well as control um, can be vegetation, certainly reed canary grass and, and other even native species can be really challenging. And then um, building on what was discussed prior to me, you know, browse protection being pretty critical. And so these are diversification plantings certainly carry the same challenges that any planting in our riparian zone does. But a lot of the emphasis has been kind of, can we get trees out ahead of EAB to maintain that function? In the urban context, and again, Joanne can certainly speak to this and as well as Allaire um, with what Vermont Land Trust is doing, um, but there's been some thinking now, can we actually use herbicides, uh, sorry, insecticides in rural settings to protect um, individual trees, and in some cases, even groves of trees, depending on the level of investment. And so there's a lot of different insecticides in the market for protecting ash um, trees, but MMEC and benzoate um, is the only one that really makes sense um, for forested contexts, given both um, it's injected into the stem, so you don't have those um, kind of uh, those consequences to pollinators and aquatic communities that you get with a soil drench. Um, and it's also the duration is, is now kind of basically people are viewing it as a three year application. So every three years you're applying that. And so even though it costs, you know, it's not a, not a trivial amount of money um, that's, that's being incurred every three years and, and really can work on, on all size classes of ash, including big, big trees, which is which is often a challenge some other controls have. There is an organic alternative, um, triazin, um, but you know, this is less effective um, when there's actually high EAB densities. And so if you really wanna use this for protecting trees um, and there is EAB active in, in a region, this is more of an annual application. And so um, certainly um, an option that's being tried in some places in Vermont, but, but less, less effective in terms of um, high infestation rates. So if you were to do this um, in terms of like chemical preservation of ash, um, really, really the, the challenge is timing is everything. You don't wanna be doing it too far ahead of time because you're wasting money and, and, and also adding lots of chemicals to the environment. Um, and so sadly at this point, most of Vermont and many other places are within uh, 15 to 30 miles from some known infestation. And so um, treating those trees ahead of that um, kind of infestation occurring, I'm certainly doing it while trees are still vigorous. And so, you know, trees with less than 50% um, kind of healthy canopy really are kind of beyond the point of, of investing in in terms of, of chemical treatments. And then timing, kind of doing this in late spring so that you can kind of maximize the impact, both in the larvae that are within the phloem as well as the adults feeding on the leaves. And what folks have found, those that are like wondering, how do I scale this, you know, if I have, you know, thousands of ash trees. Um, one thing that has been helpful from some recent work is that um, folks have shown that if an ash is adjacent to, an, so if an untreated ash is adjacent to a large diameter ash that was treated, there seems to be this adjacency effect where on um, this graph on the right is showing kind of the, the canopy condition of untreated ash and those that were actually not treated, but, but next to kind of large diameter trees that were treated um, also seem to be withstanding emerald ash borer um, infestation, partly because um, the, the adult, um, you know, EAB are actually feeding on leaves, right? And so they're kind of kind of, um, you know, that you're reducing kind of population density um, in that localized area. Other ways of kind of preservation, um, certainly there's a lot of work looking at biological approaches. Um, and, and the timing for this one is kind of kind of unfortunate. You really can't um, be releasing parasitoids until you have the, the species they like to eat upon in the area. And so it's really limited to places where um, EAB is already present in the state. On this map on the right, I'm just kind of showing all the kind of recent release um, locations in the region. Um, there's a lot of great work going on um, with, with the state as Vermont, um, state of New York, as well as APHIS, um, looking at different ways to protect trees. And the three main uh, parasitoids that have been released um, in our region, I mean, I've shown at least the ability to survive in our environment. Um, uh, th these three uh, kind of wasp and the egg, egg parasitoid here, Ubius. And of, of these three, kind of the, the top two um, really, really are these, these wasp species that, um, you know, with Spathius actually is a very long ovipositor. So it's been shown to actually be able to protect um, even larger diameter ash trees, which has been one of the challenges with some of these parasitoids. And so um, there does seem to be some promise um, that these biocontrols um, are, are able to kind of keep EAB in check in, once we've kind of had an infestation move through an area, but um, we can't kind of be releasing these preemptively without the, the host. So the final adaptation approach I'm dealing with um, preserving ash is really thinking about that cultural value. And again, um, not a hat to a layer and others that have been kind of working with the, the, the MAMA project and other approaches trying to both kind of monitor ash, but also um, collect seed from ash um, as a way to try to provide that future opportunity in the future. And so if you do have ash on your property or ash in the lands that you are a steward for, thinking about are there other opportunities to actually be, be proactively collecting ash 
um, seed, particularly um, black ash seed, um, with, with, you know, given the species is most vulnerable um, to terranormal ash borer. And so a lot of the prioritization for collecting seed is often on trees that have, you know, kind of these, these characteristics, you know, good, good overall form, um, but they are lingering. So if it's a tree that seems to not be um, succumbing to emerald ash borer right away, those might be individuals to collect from. Um, and so doing that, you know, in September and October when, when seed is mature, and also kind of keeping track of where you're doing this from, you know, again, our region um, collectively has a little bit less experience with um, seed source control, just given, um, you know, artificial regeneration in, in, in our forestry applications has been such a minimal part of what we do just relative to other areas of the country. And so, um, you know, really keeping track of where that seed's coming from, because um, it's going to be critical, you know, when we then try to find ways to get that seed back in the landscape. And we're fortunate to have, again, both local, um, tribal, and, and other efforts for collecting seed, as well as national seed collection efforts that um, can kind of give you both um, advice on whether it's even worth collecting seed from that location, maybe it's already a location where there's a lot of information for, as well as a lot of guidance on how to best uh, process and store that seed. The other piece that I think is critical is, is beyond preserving kind of future regenerative capacity and preserving kind of living material on the landscape, um, you know, I, I can't underscore enough just how important it is also to provide the opportunity for indigenous you know, basket makers and others to have access to possibly preserving um, the material that's going to be so um, threatened and rare um, as the live black ash resources impacted. And in particular, um, many of you are well aware of kind of how, you know, black ash is pounded and splints are pulled from black ash and used for, for various applications, you know, most popularized through baskets. But there, there's certainly some, some basket makers that have documented that we can actually store these splints um, and rehydrate them you know, after decades of storage. And so there's the opportunity to, you know, while we still have ash in the landscape, um, to you know, harvest basket um, suitable trees and pound the splints and store those splints and then, and then provide access for future generations to use them. So the key bottleneck for this um, preservation is really is access to those areas that have black ash. And so um, both Vermont Land Trust, um, Vermont Family Forest, and others um, around the country have been really thinking through um, cultural access um, with different land use agreements um, through easement language and other language. And so really um, would, would argue that folks start thinking a bit more critically about this. You know, if you have black ash on your property or on lands that you work with, um, developing agreements for, for tribes to have access to those areas to, to collect that material. So the, the final point in terms of, of addressing this, and again, um, we'll have a couple other presentations that'll get more into the, the detail of, of how folks are thinking about this, but there is no silver bullet. I mean, it, you know, I guess I'm maybe sounding positive uh, today that preserving ash and so forth, but you know, we would still emerald ash borer. It's still a very high level of mortality. And, and, and we have learned from other places that um, you know, a lot of trees have died. And so trying multiple um, options for preservation in a given landscape, um, you know, really is kind of the, the most, fruitful path forward for this. And so as an example, some of the work doing systemic insecticides has shown that, you know, by concentrating, you know, some trees, you know, with, with, with those stem, stem, and treat, stem injection treatments, um, what happens is that only a, you know, a small number of trees in that population actually get infested by emerald ash borer. And so woodpeckers and other parasitoids kind of hone in on those trees and can be much more effective um, in those kind of isolated applications as opposed to um, trying to control um, larval densities across the entire stand. And so combining different approaches certainly is one way to go about doing that. And I think the bigger bigger key strategy is just um, doing what certainly Allison has coordinated today and more broadly you know, across the region. There's been a tremendous community of practice that has grown around um, how to deal with the potential loss of ash. And I would argue has been highly biased towards uplands, um, you know, really thinking about kind of white ash in, in, in areas where we have a lot of, I think, more common touch points between making decisions about cutting a tree or not, and, and how do we how do we think through that? But you know, it's been a very powerful community um, in terms of exchanging ideas, certainly being humbled um, by the magnitude of the challenge, and thinking through you know are there ways for us to um, you know maintain ash in the landscape and, and, and find ways to maintain those values um, that that we really gain from that species despite this this novel threat. And so to the point, you know, kind of finish with that, you know, I I'm it's it's not possible in every landscape to do this in, but given we now know there are these tools that are effective, um, largely safe, um, and certainly um, seem to be gaining promise. Again, the, the parasitoids, it's amazing um, in five years how much more um, hope there is, I think, in the region for those parasitoids, at least having the ability to maintain some populations of, of healthy ash into the future. 
And so it really, there is no excuse to not try um, to kind of maintain ash if, if you have those resources or an ownership that's interested in that. Um, and I think, you know, the key is that, you know, we really are sharing information rapidly um, and kind of what works. Um, the state of New Hampshire is a great resource to look at right now. They're, they're going for it um, at pretty large scales in terms of protecting ash um, in rural settings. And so um, they're, they're very helpful to learn from, but I think, you know, we need to learn from many others that are trying things out there um, and trying to maintain those, those functions. And so with the learning from others uh, queue, I will kick it over to um, certainly um, Alaire and Joanne to talk a bit more about kind of how, how they're approaching that with their, um, with their land base. And at the end, we'll, I think we should have some time for, for questions from, from folks. And yeah, I think Tony, you said, I think it's, it's easy to just get really depressed about Emerald Ash Borer. And I think that while the, the outlook for the trees themselves is, is pretty bleak um, and you know, those numbers are not, maybe we, we can think that it might be a little bit different in Vermont than it was further west. Um, it's, it's not going to, it, we're gonna have a bleak future. We're not going to have many ash left in our landscape, but I still think there are so many opportunities for resilience. Um, both for the trees and for people um, and in the way that we relate to ash and the way we engage and value this species. So just a, a little bit of context about why and how Vermont Land Trust it has been engaging with ash. So on the left here um, is a map of our, our current conserved land portfolio, all the green, and there are some other colors in there too, but those are all conserved lands. Um, with a VLT easement as of um, as of today or as of yesterday, um, along with the major rivers, because I wanted to show with this group of people the way that that these conserved lands align with with our um, our watersheds, and this is about I think it's six hundred and twenty thousand acres, give or take um, some. That's about eleven percent of Vermont, and I've seen statistics that Vermont has one hundred and fifty million ash trees. So without doing the 11% calculation to just say 10%, that would be at least 15 million ash trees on conserved lands if we if they're distributed equally. So there's a lot of ash trees on lands that, that we've conserved. Um, you know, these are mostly private lands. Um, <clears throat> some of them are fee lands, some of them are public lands, but they're, they're all lands that we continue to have um, relationships with the landowners or we are the landowners. Um, and so we have a, a really wonderful role um, in terms of having a continuous relationship with, um, in terms of stewardship. And so we've got four foresters on staff. There's me as an ecologist um, and others who engage with landowners pretty regularly. And so we, we talk deeply with people. Um, we, we talk with them about um, their forest management plans. We work with consulting, their consulting foresters. Um, we have public events and communications. And so these are all great platforms for us to really bring um, this current research out to the public. Um, and one thing that I remember feeling really sad about when Emerald Ash Borer first was found in Vermont, it was something I had been kind of like waiting for, hoping it wasn't going to happen for years. Um, I was looking at every ash tree and every little hole on, on every tree that I saw. Um, just worried that once it came to Vermont, people would just start wholesale cutting their trees. And I think Tony, you've done, a, done great research and also shared, um, you know, partnered and shared research about the fact that we don't, that's not what needs to happen. Um, people do not need to just liquidate their, their ash and their forests once EAB has been found in the state or even nearby where they live. And um, so it's, we get out with landowners and we, we talk with them about kind of like, what are some management strategies that are really based on the most current research? And because Emerald Ash Borer has only been in our country for 20 years, um, the research is, is really rapidly evolving, it's dynamic, and so it's really important to stay on top of it because there's new information coming out all the time. Um, on, the, on the right here, it's just a photo of two VLT staffers. This was the first, um, we, we went out and visited the first EAB infestation site um, in Orange County back in 2018, just to, to get a sense of what, what it looked like. And um, so this is something we've been working on since the since before EAB came to Vermont, but then have been kind of on the ground ever since. So I, um, you know, once we, once EAB came to Vermont, I guess I should say too, before I jump into some of the other details is that we looked through our conserved lands portfolio and did some analysis about where ash um, were, were found on our conserved lands. And so the work that I do, I map natural communities. Um, those of you who were here yesterday, 
heard Bob Zeno talk about um, floodplain forest, natural communities, other wetlands. And so there's there's several natural communities that are really dominated by ash, um, black ash seepage swamps, um, hemlock balsam for black ash seepage swamps. There are green ash swamps. Um, there are floodplain forests that many of them have a high percentage of ash. Rich Northern hardwood forest has a high percentage of white ash as, as an upland forest. But many of the ash dominated natural communities are wetlands or riparian communities. So we were able to go back through our portfolio and do some analysis um, from the natural community mapping we had done and from some other, other sources um, as well to try, you know, finding forested wetlands and calcium rich areas, which many times there's a lot of black ash in those. And to think about where some hotspots of, of ash were, to, to think about landowners that we might um, be able to reach out to um, or places that we might be able to use as demonstration sites for some of our ash related programming. Um, so I would say that the, the one of the first, the first way that we engage with ash um, at EAB um, is through that lens with the conserved land portfolio, talking to landowners, holding technical events like this one, which happened in Rupert um, at a, a piece of conserved land um, with a landowner, just with a, a bunch of foresters and, and other engaged people who were really thinking about like, what do I do? What do I do in my woods? I'm um, planning some management. Do I need to change that now that EAB is in the state? Um, how do I think about the future of my forest? So we've had um, at least three events that are very specifically technically geared toward landowners um, and consulting foresters. Um, we've had a, I think a, um, a webinar, but this, you know, before COVID happened, we were able to have a couple of, of in-person events. We'll continue to do that as people are interested in this. Um, you know, we work with consulting foresters, sharing information um, and, just kind of, we get a lot of questions. You know, I checked in with, with the four foresters at VLT before this presentation and, and they confirmed, like they continue to get questions from people um, who are planning to do, to work in their, in their lands. Um, interestingly, um, you know, in terms of this group of people with riparian, um, as a riparian focus, for the most part, foresters, landowners are not looking to do timber harvest in riparian areas. That's a good thing um, in our, most of our easements. Um, there's some kind of riparian protections. If they're not in the easement, there's, um, you know, there's state law against uh, that that doesn't allow a lot of a lot of management um, in riparian areas along streams. Um, but these are places where people are interested in sort of thinking about um, how watching out for EAB as well. Um, so that is one way, just that kind of direct landowner and forester engagement that can look like helping people recognize ash, like what is this tree. Um, what are some common other trees you can mistake it for? How do you identify at different seasons? Um, the three main species, white ash, black ash, and green ash, um, all of which are, you know, can, can occur in riparian areas and some of, some of which are really um, pretty common, like green ash um, in the Champlain Valley. Black ash occurs in small floodplain forests throughout the state um, and also in headwaters. Um, so head, sort of seepage headwater swamps that then can coalesce, those co the water there coalesces into streams. Those are often really great places to find black ash. Um, white ash, you know, we think of it as, as an upland species, but I, I see it really frequently um, in just like occasional trees in floodplain forests as well, especially floodplain forests that don't get frequently flooded. So they're not, they're not, they're well-drained um, soils. You know, we help people see the signs of EAB. Um, unfortunately, I just took these photos a couple of weeks ago up in the Champlain Islands. Um, I had, like I said, spent years looking for these signs to try to be ahead of the ahead of the curve, and now the you know the curve is ahead of me. Um, on the right is a, a that classic D-shaped exit hole um, from the the insect um, chewing its way out of um, a tree. This is, and then on the left is the same tree with the, those classic like woodpecker pecks. So you see that really that blonding um, spot kind of in the upper third. Of the tree, if you look closely there, there's a small little black hole. That's where a woodpecker has gone in and extracted the larva from beneath the bark. And so, as Tony said, woodpeckers can be a really great um, natural um, natural predator for EAB larvae. Um, and so, we are really interested in ha helping landowners and others be able to recognize these signs. Um, and so, on this tree, if you look closely at it, there's a few more of those those bright um, woodpecker pecks, um, showing that the woodpeckers had been active there. Um, I've heard some statistics that they can, you know, in a, in a large tree, they can extract like thousands of larvae um, over the course of a winter. So one thing that we are interested in telling landowners is like, um, if you're going to be cutting ash to um, not to do it, what is it? Uh, I'm not a forester, so I, I might kind of, I'm going to skip that part. But there's like, if you cut the tree and then it 
and there's larvae in the bark and you leave the log over the winter, the woodpeckers are not going to be attracted to that right there. So you'd want to leave the tree up for the winter, cut it in the spring before it leaves out. Tony, I think you're maybe nodding. <laughs> um, so thinking about things like that, can we let the woodpeckers do their job, create the conditions for that to happen? Um, another way that, that Vermont Land Trust is engaged with kind of resilience um, around Denver Blash Borer is on this really important um, cultural piece. And so we have been working with um, Abenaki partners from since before um, Yabi was found in Vermont and just wanting to understand sort of what their needs are, what the needs are for basket material, um, where basket grade trees are found. There's only a very small percentage of, of black ash trees that are suitable for basket making. So we're helping, we're just trying to understand sort of where those, those trees are found on our conserved lands or, or places where we might be able to help um, basket makers access wood um, that they need. Um, and the, this slide, the upper left corner is, um, that's Carrie Wood. Um, she's an Abenaki basket maker. She's in this picture, she's holding a basket that was made in decades ago by one of her ancestors. And she picked up um, basket making um, later on in her life. And it's just like, was inspired in many ways by this family heritage. Um, on the right there, the outdoor picture is her son, Aaron, um, who's also a basket maker and also processes the wood. And he's standing by a black ash tree in Montpelier um, in one of those little stupid Chedwater swamps. Um, and the lower left pictures, or the sorry, the lower pictures are Carrie and Aaron um, in a workshop that we sponsored with North Branch Nature Center back in 2019, um, where they um, they brought material. We went out in the woods um, to look at the trees. So the picture the picture with Aaron outside is at, at the North Branch Nature Center's land, um, and then attendees were able to make a basket. So we were really excited to sort of amplify this this amazing cultural tradition to support Abenaki artists um, in teaching and to just spread awareness through this kinesthetic experience of, of weaving a basket, which is just incredibly powerful. Um, I hope that all of you are able to do that, just to have your hands on this material and to understand a little bit about the significance of it from that very like sensory place. Um, so we've held a couple of events um, celebrating um, indigenous connections to ash. And then, like I said, we also are part of a couple of different coalitions that are trying to identify great places for um, basket quality ash trees and then make those trees available to Abenaki harvesters. Um, these may be lands that, you know, that VLT owns. And in some cases, it's private landowners with conserved land who reach out to us and say they're interested in um, making the trees on their land available to um, to basket makers. And so we try to make those connections when we can. Um, and we've been building relationships with Carrie and Aaron and other basket makers um, for several years. And that's just incredibly meaningful part of our work um, to me to be of service to the Abenaki community in this way. Um, we're working on a big ash pounding event that's going to be happening in the Nohegan Basin. Again, a VLT is one among many partners um, that's coordinating, mo coordinated mostly with um, the Conti Refuge that'll be happening this spring where the goal is just to, to pound as much ash as we can and to create those stockpiles like Tony showed in that great picture with all the, the rings of ash splints hanging in that, in that barn or in that room. Uh, yeah, that's all I'll say on that piece for now. Um, and then beyond the Abenaki community, I think there are, you know, ash is an important tree for all of us. It's a part of our landscape. Um, 150 million trees in Vermont, they're beautiful, gorgeous trees. And so there's this piece of just like, connection to the tree. Um, so we're involved in, in events like this when we can be, because I just think it's really important to help people understand um, the value of this tree kind of in their culturally um, for all of us. This was an event that happened in Greensboro in 2019 with um, that Vermont Land Trust worked on with several partners, including a, an arts organization called Wonder Arts. Um, we had, I don't know, 60 or 70 people um, learned about ash, learned about EAB. We had a scavenger hunt for kids. We had this drawing workshop where people were drawing like twigs and learning to like really identify some of the details of the tree biologically, um, which was great. And so I'm really excited about opportunities like that. Um, we have a, an ongoing project that's a little bit of a dormant phase right now <laughs> um, called Ash Stories. And I just want to put this out there for everybody. If you're interested or you can share this with your communities, um, ash at vlt.org, it just goes to me. Um, but I, th I think that as we are moving, you know, more continuing into this stage of losing our ash trees, 
these trees are really valuable to all of us. Um, so I'm just asking people to share, you know, photos, stories. We've gotten poems, we've gotten song lyrics that people have composed, um, just sent to me. I'm compiling them for now. We had them on our website. We just have had a new website where that piece of it is not up yet. Um, but I really encourage people to send any stories to me. And this is one thing that we're trying to do, um, especially like as we're connecting, you know, in this group, connecting with our watersheds um, and our riparian areas, there are some really important ash trees in those places that people might real, feel really connected to. Um, I am going to quickly go through this part. Um, so we have also been working in a sort of a citizen science capacity. And that is really closely partnering with this group, Ecological Research Institute. Um, it's a partnership of a husband and wife, um, Jonathan Rosenthal and Radka Bildova. Um, they are out of um, sort of Eastern New York um, and they have this program monitoring and managing ash mama, um, Tony referred to it. And we've been working with them since EAB was discovered in Vermont. Um, and they have this really great and very interesting citizen science project that not only helps people connect to ash on their land, but also has a real um, contribution to our, our collective knowledge. Um, I, am, I find this, this concept really compelling, this emotional stages of EAB invasion, um, denial, fear, sadness, and resignation. So you start when you're in denial, and then you know, as trees, as you know, the first um, infestations start to happen, you get you're afraid, you're a little sad, and then you're resigned. And so this citizen science project is meant to kind of like buoy people up. Um, but there's something productive that we can do um, as, as we're moving through these stages. And so here's the website. It's just um, monitoringash.org. There's a lot of information here. But we are working with Jonathan and Radka and many other partners on these tasks that they've, they've developed for each stage of EAB infestation. And they're, they're taking those emotional you know, stages and saying, here are things you can do to like combat those, those negative feelings at each point that are productive. Um, and so what we have ended up doing, and I can share this if I don't have time to get into it deeply here, what we've ended up doing is working with people to, to develop monitoring plots where they're looking for those really rare lingering ash trees that Tony mentioned. You know, one to maybe 5% of the population are considered to be lingering. They have their own natural resistance to EAB. Um, and you don't know that they're lingering ash until the infestation has gone along far enough that most of the other trees have died and they're still alive. So we're working with people to, to set up plots of trees on their land. These are like 40 trees um, on their land and then tracking the, the onset and then the progression of emerald ash borer infestation in those trees. Those are entered into a citizen science um, program, a, a website called Anecdata. And then over time, this is an annual monitoring um, sort of commitment from the landowners. It's about a half a day set up to set up the plot. Um, two hours a year, you know, afterward, the information all goes into this, this um, citizen science program. And then as the trees begin to be infested and to die, then there are these next steps that you go out into certain radius around the plot and look for tree ash trees that are still alive. So knowing that there's like one to 5% of trees might be lingering ash, it's a pretty low chance that the 40 that are in the plot are going to be lingering ash, but they are sort of the epicenter that you can use to then go out and look for those trees that would be um, that would be having the natural resilience to EAB. So these are just three of the plots that we've got. Um, they're in the first two are in headwater wetland areas that then coalesce into streams later on. The bottom one down Arlington is along a stream, so it's in a, rip, in a riparian area. Mm -hmm. um, here's the Anic Data website. I'm happy to share more information about this with anybody um, if you're interested. I think this is a great tool, um, and it could be a great tool for folks who are working in riparian forests because these trees are, are maybe not ones that are going to be harvested or going to be treated with the insecticide. You can't be planning to harvest or treat trees that are that are part of this monitoring project. Um, there's 58, I think there's more, I think this, this number was a little bit old. As of um, this year, we've got 12 plots in Vermont. Like I said, they, they tell us where and, and when to look for lingering ash and it's a focal point for our outreach. And so these are great places where I've worked with multiple community partners to set up the plots, to talk about them, to help understand how to recognize ash and, and how to recognize EAB. Um, so with that, I want to just thank everybody. Thank you, Tony, and um, pass the baton to Joanne. Thanks very much.
extension. So Joanne, take it away. Thanks so much, Allison. Um, and thank you, Tony and Alaire. Uh, so we're already uh, at 1045-ish. So I'll try to wrap up speaking um, by 11. And then for folks who are able to stay for questions, I'd love to chat more. But um, I'll start by saying yes to everything that Alaire and Tony said. And they made some of my presentation a little shorter because we're really touching on some of the same topics. Um, but as um, Allison mentioned, I work for the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program. Um, I'm staffed at Vermont Forest Parks and Recreation for the state of Vermont. And our program has two staff um, in FPR and two, three staff at UVM Extension. And so we have really this integrated approach to work with municipalities. And so the information that I can share about ash trees has a very specific lens on um, municipal preparedness. But like anything, it's all connected. So the people who I, I often work with are um, either municipal staff or municipal volunteers who come with a, you know, their hat on to think about their community and their public trees. But there also might be private landowners. They might work with a land trust somewhere or have a conserved area. So when we talk about ash trees in public spaces, um, people are often asking great questions as they think about ash in their lawn and in their woods and in maybe someone else's woods that they know. Um, and we end up having pretty complex conversations that go beyond just one green ash standing on a sidewalk. Um, so that's the role that that our program plays in speaking about Emerald Ash Borer. And really, when when Emerald Ash Borer was confirmed in Vermont in early 2018, although it was news, it was not a surprise. And there were many communities that had EAB preparedness plans dating back four or five years in Vermont. Um, so really, you know, thinking about this photo here of a lot of green ash, um, not being there in the next uh, um, 10 to 20 years. And you can see also already some interplanting between trees. You know, it's important to think about uh, ash trees in urban and community settings, not only um, ecologically, what we're gonna lose without these trees um, there and all the benefits they provide, but also as a type of municipal infrastructure. They're not replaceable, just like that. It takes a long time to grow these. Um, so it's, you know, pretty humbling that something this size that fits in the palm of your hand easily would have such a broad effect um, in North America and in statewide. Uh, I liked Tony's map a little better of, of some of the um, known infestations across North America. This one, um, having spent a lot of time in Quebec, it's it's funny to see the whole whole province colored green for having EAB. I know there's there's not a lot of trees at all up in the top there. So um, so it's certainly a pest that has spread um, far and beyond what we could have imagined and very quickly uh, carried in the back of uh, pickup trucks, in the back of your camper with some firewood, in nursery stock, in wood packaging. Um, and this map on the right is uh, our most current map maintained by Forest Parks and Recreation of kind of a heat map of known infestations in Vermont and then a 10 mile radius around those known infestations. So that you know, bright, bright red spot in the Washington County, Caledonia County area is some of that initial infestation in the Groton Orange Plainfield area. And it really is, um, I was out there last month in L.R. Jones State Forest and it's it's kind of spooky <laughs> to walk there with all these uh, standing ash trees being affected by, you know, at this point you see the woodpecker damage, but um, there's a reason for that. And just in, in that remote place, feels very remote to, to find so much EAB there is pretty alarming. Um, so really, you know, working with municipalities, we're thinking it, at these urban and community levels, which could be your village center, downtown, but also miles and miles and miles of rural roads that are lined with all kinds of trees, including ash trees. And really acknowledging that ash trees play a really important role um, in rural areas and public forest lands, but then very commonly, particularly green ash are planted as street trees, really resilient, hardy downtown tree until now. <laughs> um, so for example, in Montpelier where I am, uh, all the mature trees on um, Main Street are green ash. And so there's an approach to kind of 
treat some of them with insecticide, plant other trees and have a long-term plan to grow urban canopy um, in light of losing some of these beautiful and mature downtown trees. We also talk a lot about safety. Um, there are a million reasons to leave ash trees standing. Um, as Tony said, they, they all die from a chainsaw if you apply that. Um, but in the in an urban setting or where there's any kind of risk, um, there's certainly not only a, a fear of ash trees failing in really unpredictable ways and falling on people, property, um, but also once a tree is infested, taking that tree down is much more expensive, much more dangerous uh, for arborists or any kind of municipal staff who are doing tree removals. Um, so, you know, for a municipality, they're really thinking about risk assessment and then their own capacity to do anything about such a, a, a broad problem. And um, public input. A lot of communities have created an EAD plan and they need to present that to the public. And Alaire's, um, when she shared that map of, of EAB emotions, like, yes, they're all there, people. You know, we all want to think we're, we're a little special in some way and it won't affect us. <laughs> and, and sadly, that, that probably won't be the case. Um, EAB is not a federally regulated pest anymore. Um, and what that means money-wise is that there really isn't any <laughs> for municipalities and that municipalities and, and private landowners will bear the responsibility and the cost of managing ash trees. Um, we are yearly, our program applies for grant funding from um, the Forest Service. And we have been able in the past to fund some ash tree removals, you know, proactive removals of trees in high risk areas. Um, right now, all of our USDA funding that's coming is focused on replanting. And so I invite all of you to think carefully and creatively about this type of funding. Uh, if you know you're losing ash and there is money available, perhaps not to manage the ash, but to plant something else, um, particularly in areas, you know, thinking of, of towns like Northfield, of many of our towns where the river runs right through it, what can you think about planting in those areas? Um, to serve some of the same functions as ash, both ecologically and, and socially. So we look a lot at thinking about where towns are on the spectrum of how they may manage EAB. On the left, you see some interplanting. The city of Burlington is not going to be treating ash trees, but they're already planting between ash trees so that when removal happens, there are other diverse species of trees ready to grow and take their place. Um, treating with insecticide is super effective and is affordable for some trees. Um, it's a, and it's something that the state is talking about now in certain areas. It's, it's time consuming. You definitely having ash in sort of clumped together geographically does help that process speed up a little. But um, with either emamectin benzoate or azadiractin applied every two to three and hopefully spread out to every five years perhaps after the, the bulk of EAB passes through our region, um, it is an affordable way to protect some of this really important urban community infrastructure. And then on the right there, just a picture of Rural Road, and that's where I've spent a lot of my time um, working with communities on their ash tree inventories. And so this is a um, really a first tool that we offer to municipalities to think about, well, how many ash trees do you have? We did a really, uh, interesting series of workshops with Vermont local roads and um, municipal road crews, getting them thinking about, okay, what is EAB? How is it going to affect the, the trees along your roads and, and think about your safety? And one of our questions kind of in our group gathering was how many ash trees do you think you have along your rural roads in the right of way? Is it like tens, hundreds, thousands? <laughs> like those were sort of the, the choices to think about. And some folks knew, you know, they they drive their roads every day, but many were like, you know, I, I just have no idea, maybe hundreds, and often it's thousands <laughs> in the rural right of way um, that communities are thinking about managing. Um, so what that has kind of looked like is there's there's a lot of different places that you might do inventory. On the left there, um, I think that's on St. St. Michael's College um, campus green ash everywhere. I would definitely look for EAB in parking lots. It seems to be popping up there a lot. Um, and uh, so folks are doing that in their, their urban areas. Uh, second from the left is 
in Peacham, where we were last summer doing a lot of rural road ash inventory along some very forested road, thinking about utility corridors. The, all the utility companies are well aware of EAB and the threat it poses to ash trees and therefore their lines. Um, but that's a big part of our landscape too and understanding who's gonna manage what and manage which risk and, and who should safely be managing each type of ash tree um, is really important data to collect. And then on the right, black ash research, um, both Tony and Alaire mentioned the critical importance of understanding the threat to black ash and really um, where they are now and where they're not going to be within a, a couple of decades or less. And all three of us are actually working with a UVM graduate student at the moment um, who's beginning to look at black ash specifically uh, data inventory um, through community science projects. There's lots to say about that and happy to talk about it probably another time, but it's it's really exciting to add another piece of information and like very timely data, connect, data collection. So this is just one example of all the dots that pop up um, of some groups that have done roadside ash inventory, thinking about the right of way. You know, I've got some, some municipalities that are pretty proactive. They're, they did their inventory and they're trying just step-by-step step to remove some ash carefully from roadsides, plant other species of trees, think carefully about which trees will be these resilient roadside trees in the future and leave those there. Other municipalities where they, um, they just wanna know what ash are there and they fully admit that their municipality has no money or capacity or time to do anything about it. They're just gonna wait and see what happens. But there's some interested folks who just really wanna take a look and see where ash trees are and what the impact of EAB will be on their public places. Um, they're in our database, I did a check yesterday, there's 55,000 um, and 18 data points. And each data point may be more than one tree. Often it's one, but it can be more than that. Um, in 49 municipalities, I would say at least another dozen municipalities have done their own type of um, public ways and places ash inventory. Um, so just to highlight, there's a lot of ash trees out there. And I think while communities manage dead trees all the time, the, the, the wave of dead trees that will come through quite simultaneously will be pretty alarming to communities. Um, and it will be interesting to see how different roads and different public spaces, uh, weather, ice storms, wind storms, you know, snow load as, as we move through the bulk of EAB infestation. This type of inventory is serving as a model for agency of transportation and state right away and agency of natural resources, um, you know, state lands um, inventory. And I'll really stress it's like pretty much all volunteers that do this work. They, they get trained up on a smartphone or cell enabled tablet with some free software and a login from me. And then we go for some long walks and there's really a lot, a lot to see and talk about. That is the silver lining for sure to get to see a lot of roadside vegetation, public space vegetation um, and capture some pretty beautiful photographs no matter where you end up. Uh, in Chittenden County, the RPC has done some dashboard work with some of this roadside data. So you can like zoom in road by road, which becomes really important for municipalities to understand the impact of EAB. Um, again, that's through Chittenden County's RPC, a little fancier than what we can offer. But um, if you're in Chittenden County, your RPC is pretty awesome. And it's our, all the RPCs for helping with, with mapping. I talked a bit about training. Um, we, we really do, as a program, reach out to a lot of uh, municipal crews, public works, road crews, parks crews, and say like, look, this is a really big deal. Um, safety, ash trees become very brittle. And even if we choose to do nothing about ash trees in parking lots, on popular trailheads, in your downtown, um, there's still an effect. Maybe some will be lingering and, and resistant to EAB, but we don't know that until EAB passes through and that's a risk to take um, you know, on the corner of State and Main Street. So this is a training we did last summer, um, ultimately working with an arborist from Connecticut who had a lot of experience with EAB infested ash trees and working on how you, know, how you get them down to the ground. We're, 
if a tree is infested, there's largely not a safe way to do it from the ground uh, because the tree may, may fall on folks. So there's really a lot of bucket truck work. Uh, we'll be holding some workshops this summer on risk tree assessment and, and throwing in line with ropes um, to be able to safely guide trees down um, in, in infested areas without having to be right underneath them. I'll wrap it up pretty soon of just saying that our program has been able to um, award grant funding to several municipalities to at first um, fund some ash tree removals now really funding what's called EAB reforestation so also known as tree planting and um, and are able to, to publish some case studies now about that work we initially had half a dozen case studies many of which were from communities out of state but now in Vermont we're doing it too. Um, so just a couple of examples in Waterbury, they received a um, $15,000 grant from the program and needed to also match that with their own um, in-kind or budget services. They, they did treat some ash trees in Hope Cemetery and, and Hope Davy Park, so some really popular community areas, um, but they took down some large ash trees along rural roads and had this really, I love that picture in the bottom left, they had this program of um, the landowners donated the downed wood to the municipality. It was brought to a marshaling area in town where a bunch of volunteers bucked and split wood for, for firewood that was sold um, for, a, for a small amount and all that money was donated to two different uh, local community funds, nonprofits. So it's like a second life for this wood that is not as good of the life it would have had <laughs> um, standing as a tree, but really some communities taking it upon themselves to get connected, to learn something from this and to um, benefit people with, with firewood in their community. Um, a second example is here in Northfield. Similarly, they were removing some trees, treating, um, treating a couple, if you've been to Northfield's green there, there are two beautiful green ash right on the village center. Um, and you know these things are just irreplaceable <laughs> in the short term. So it's great to see some of that treatment happening and, and really awareness of you know for future generations what ash trees look like. And then similarly replanting, they were able to plant fairly cheaply, um, but primarily because of donations from their Rotary Club. Um, so it's a it's an expensive process. This is the most expensive forest pest we've seen come through urban areas. I think I have just two more slides to share. Pesticide use, um, it's effective and it's not that simple. <laughs> and we've already seen communities, members, you know, who want to do the right thing. They say, oh, I found this, this, this special plug and I bought it on Amazon and it's going to protect my tree from EAB. And um, as in our program, we've had to get up to speed with Agency of Agriculture of, you know, are, which insecticides are effective, which ones have the least impact, other ecological impacts, um, who can apply them on public trees, on your own trees, on government, you know, trees on government land. There's a lot of different rules attached to that. And, then, and finally, you know, which ones are legal in Vermont and helping people understand what that looks like. And it's certainly worth um, reading a couple of our outreach documents, particularly this frequently asked questions um, for all folks to understand um, how to apply insecticides legally and correctly um, because, because they're trunk injected, they can also damage the tree. Um, if you don't quite know what you're doing and, and trying to inject something into a tree by drilling holes in it may ultimately uh, be the death of it too. So, and maybe my last piece, but um, Tony mentioned this is biocontrols. Yes, they are being released at present on two sites on state uh, in, in Vermont. I think they're hoping to launch it on two more this summer. Tony showed a couple pictures of the different species and all three are being released on state lands. You know, the, the best case scenario of biocontrols is not that they eradicate EAB, but that there's essentially a way to bring the EAB population down so that younger ash, new ash trees are have a like a fighting chance. <laughs> they're they're um, parasitic wasps that will be able to keep down the keep at bay the population of EAB and um, 
we see some kind of future, you know, not at all like the present of ash, but some kind of future of ash that keeps both native ash populations and, you know, allows us more time, buys more time to continue to research hybridized ash and EAB resistant ash um, that folks are working on now. Um, I think the third season of EAB, of WASP release is going to be this spring and fall. And then it moves into a monitoring program with an attempt that, you know, statewide eventually these populations of parasitic wasps will start to intersect and be keeping EAB populations down in certain areas. So there's a, definitely a lot of ways to, to stay informed. We're still keeping an EAB left update listserv um, of new inf confirmed infestations. Um, so if you're liking to keep track of that, particularly if you're in a municipality that does not have EAB yet, it might be nice to, to stay on top of that. Um, and our tree mail newsletter, we're also sharing opportunities about grant funding. And again, for folks in riparian areas, you know, really working in those areas, thinking carefully about replanting, because that's where we can offer funding now and technical expertise. And it'd be great to see some pretty innovative and proactive steps um, taken in anticipation of losing some ash trees. I probably went over it as well because I can't see my clock right now, but I'll pass it on to questions. <laughs> No problem, Joanne. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, we do have um, some time for questions as long as folks can stick around. I know Tony does have to jump off in just a couple of minutes, um, but if anybody has questions, you can raise your hand and ask them or feel free to type them in the chat. I'm not seeing any questions. So I guess you guys were very thorough. Oh, there's one. Um, have, there, have there been any efforts to propagate resistant ash trees found in the Midwest for nursery production? Yeah, I guess I can jump on that. Um, so Jennifer Cook, who's a, a geneticist with the US Forest Service out of the, the Delaware, Ohio office, actually the same group that works a lot on um, breeding for resistant elm, uh, they've been doing a lot of work trying to um, propagate both the lingering ash as well as do some crosses between Manchurian ash, which is a species that was found throughout the, the native range of emerald ash borer and is, is naturally resistant to that um, insect. Uh, so crossing that with black ash and green ash and trying to find ways to, to breed um, resistant trees. So like, like a lot of efforts, you, you know, think about elm or, or chestnut, you know, it takes a long time for those to be ready for, for prime time, but there's a lot of work going on right now, uh, particularly out of her group, trying to find um, ways to breed uh, individuals from those lingering ash and, and then cross with resistant strains. Thanks, Tony. Do we have any other questions? Oh, here we go from Todd. How many years after infestation are upper branches brittle and dangerous when using a chainsaw? Yeah, I mean, at least, so, yeah, I, I thought this want to take the can. I, I, I guess I, I would just say that the, um, the, the trees don't die right away. So, so once the trees are dead um, post infestation, usually with after a couple of years, you don't, people do not want to be, uh, you know, two years seems to be kind of the window. Um, at least some of the work we've been involved with, but I don't know, Joanne, and with some of the just street tree removals and things like that. Yeah, do you have a sense from that? Um, I mean, generally we're hearing from arborists, particularly arborists in the Midwest and in Southern New England, um, they won't climb infested trees at all. <laughs> and not eat, and if and they need to see a tree uh, in the summer to understand you know, the health of the canopy um, before deciding whether or not that's a tree they can climb. And in heavily infested areas, they're not climbing at all. So, you know, I would say to some extent, like after the first year, you're losing structural integrity in the tree, and that can be one of the hardest times to detect that there's anything wrong. Um, then we had in. Plainfield, the first um, known <laughs> event of a what's called ash tree snaps, like the, the, the trunk will snap very high, high in the air. Sometimes it can be a little unpredictable, but it was a 
a tree that snapped about 30 feet up in the air, deep in the woods, but unfortunately right near one of the Washington Electric Co-op lines and landed right on the transistor and put out power uh, for the whole region, unfortunately on Christmas morning. And so it was just this big wake up call of like how these trees behave when they went out to the line, of course, then it was easy and just it. Um, but I think it's really challenging to understand where a tree is in the infestation because by maybe you don't see huge signs until you're three, unless you're climbing it yearly or something to take a look. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a very humbling <laughs> best to find and, and for areas where people are, are doing forest management or tree management. If you know EAB is in the area, it's definitely important to, to be more cautious than not. Great, thanks, Joanne. Um, there was another question, but it looks like Alair answered it in the chat. Um, so if there aren't any more questions, I think we'll wrap up this session. Thank you so much, Tony, Alair, and Joanne. This was really, really informative and helpful thinking about how we're gonna manage ash on the landscape in the coming years. So really appreciate all of your insight on that. Um, for folks who are sticking around for the rest of the day, we have a very long break now, two and a half hours until we reconvene at 1.30. Um, and we have that long break because we had to cancel the session that we had um, originally scheduled for, I don't remember when it was in that window, but it was sometime in that window on uh, contracting for uh, with tree nurseries. And uh, somebody did point out to me that it wasn't entirely clear what the title, what the session of that original, what the title of that original session meant. Um, it was exploring forward contracting. And just so folks know, that was supposed to be a session talking about how we can um, work with nurseries at, as folks who purchase trees for plantings, how we can work with nurseries to set up some longer term contracts so that nurseries know uh, what trees that they need to be growing and know that they'll have a market for those trees and also people can have a predictable supply of trees. This is something that's been working really well on a pretty large scale in the Chesapeake Bay region and something that I've been thinking a lot about how we might be able to implement here to kind of address some of the native tree supply shortage that we're facing. And so we were hoping to have a session where somebody from the Chesapeake Bay region could come and talk about how that's working there and then have a discussion about what might be different and how we could implement that here. Um, unfortunately, the person who was going to do that couldn't do it. Um, in the end, she had to pull out. And so we had to cancel the session, but I'm hoping to schedule it, schedule something similar for a, a point in the future when she is available. So if that's something that you would, it would probably be more of like a, a focus group or discussion than it would be like a webinar. So if that's something that you're interested in participating in, definitely send me an email and let me know just so I know to let, let you know if and when that's happening. Otherwise, I will see people hopefully back here at 1.30. We're gonna have um, a longer session, a 90 minute session about in-stream restoration and strategic woody additions. We've got a lot of great presentations. I know that group's been talking a lot about how to make that um, session as interesting and cool as possible and informative for all of you. So I hope to see you back here then. And in the meantime, I'll leave the room open in case people wanna chat, um, but see you guys back here at 1.30.